Hi, everyone. It's Ashley Farrow Murray, theater and dance curator at MPAC. Thanks for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to introducing you all to theater maker Annie Saunders and an impressive group of collaborators that she is working with to make a new piece called Rest. Hi, Annie. It's great to have you. Do you want to start us off by talking a little bit about the group? Yeah, there are an incredible group of collaborators working on this project. Andrew Schneider is working with us uh, as a lighting designer and also creator of um, concepts for what the light and shadow might do in the space for the live performance. Uh, Andrew has also been filming some experimental light videos, so creation of images that are quite surreal and hallucinatory and um, just at the border of comprehension um, using no computer animation. So they're all made in the camera with light and shadow in the room. And those will be released as part of a, a work in progress sort of concept film for how this piece might express itself in a digital context in 2021. Early in the project, I told Chris Roundtree, who leads the experimental orchestra in LA, Wild Up, about the conceptual framework, the ideas that I had, the inspiration that I had around making something that would offer audiences a, a chance to um, examine and experience some of the things that I was thinking about to do with how we create reality um, with perception, but also participation, how that participation really manifests through sensory experience, um, what we learn under the conditions of sensory deprivation about the malleability of reality and the suggestibility of the mind. And he said, do you think that you could conceive of that as a, a piece of new music? Um, because if so, we can commission it through the orchestra and, and perhaps it's something that we can make together. So then Chris introduced me to Emma O'Halloran, who's an experimental composer, and we all started working together on this piece. And we have three dramaturgs, Rita Williams, who is an author and researcher, author of fiction and nonfiction films and television and essays, Ada Paris, who is a futurist, an artist, a creator of a field of study called Cyborg Shamanism. Uh, looking at the intersection of emerging technology and ancient and indigenous wisdom. Rachel Joy Victor, who's a computational neuroscientist, world builder, narrative designer. Jackie Zoe, who is a, a multidisciplinary artist and sound designer. James Akamura, who's a freelance creative producer. Brian Hashimoto, who's been working with us as a consultant on the video components and also uh, documentation of the project for quite some time. So incredible team of collaborators that we are working with now, mostly at a distance, but still very much with us in the virtual room. And also, of course, huge, huge thanks to the crew um, at MPAC, the curatorial crew, the engineers, everyone who has been working with us to bring this thing to life, and the Center for the Art of Performance at UCLA, who have also been supporting the project. And we will continue to be working with both institutions as, as we go forward into 2021. Yeah, it really is a diverse group of perspectives bringing their expertise to this topic. Rest is an original theater work that features new music composition, and the collaborators are exploring together what it means to make work for new platforms, from live proscenium spaces to online formats and remote devices. Before Annie and I dive into the content of the work a little bit more, let's hear from the group themselves. Wow. Hi, everybody. So happy to be introducing you all to yourselves and each other. This is Rita Williams. She's one of uh, the dramaturgs on this project. I would love to see the things that wake us up at three in the morning have their voice. Andrew Schneider, multidisciplinary artist and person that I have worked with um, before. And when I think about light and shadow, I think about you. That seems right. Um, can y'all can y'all hear me? Guys, this is Rachel Joy Victor. So I met Rachel. It's probably the best uh, meeting story. So, and she said, um, I, you know, I was a computational neuroscientist and then I went to the world building lab. And then there's the systems level. Like, what are the systems that are contributing to making that moment possible? I think rest is like 
at the convergence of both of those things. I'll go to Ada. Ada and I spoke on a panel for the Orchard Project Liveness Lab about the intersections between technology, how we interact with screen and internet technologies and virtual technologies and how those uh, are related to the body and our sort of deep pre-cognizant, pre-historic belief systems. But there's no one fixed way of approaching it and ancient wisdom in, uh, and indigenous thinking, natural systems and emerging technologies. I try to approach most of it from removing words, re removing words and actually getting into the intentionality of it through our senses. Wow. I don't, like, I go through my day and this is all I think about. <laughs> um, but some of the conversations that we've had, like, you bring your body to every experience that you have, um, which is true for us as experience makers, but also true for, like... And I'm, I, I very much don't make experiences for devices, but it's still true that you bring your body with you to uh, every experience you have, devices included. And thinking through what bodies are those, um, who gets to rest, how, what does rest look like to different bodies, um, to different identities, and, um, and then thinking about the dynamism of rest, I guess. You can't have silence without its opposite. And I think, Rita, what you were saying about inviting the shadow into the room and maybe having a relationship with that or like with yourself and then saying, not saying, here's what I would like, I would like you to experience rest now, but providing um, an invitation. Annie, I know that some of your inspiration for this project jives nicely with this idea of offering an invitation and considering different perspectives while also confronting relationships to the self. Do you want to say more about the context for rest? Yeah, you know, you, you and I have sort of come to know each other through this, through this project, but had talked, I think, before mm -hmm. about other work as well. And yeah. so, so the context by which I'm usually coming into making work is thinking about an idea or a concept or a theme that is fixating me, you know, in my day-to-day -day life. Like, what is this? What does this mean? Mm -hmm. And then also about space in some way, about site specificity or, or the use of, of space. And so the departure points for this project fit into that, like, model <laughs> in terms of, like, how I, how I start to approach work. Usually it's like something will happen to me or I'll be sort of mulling something other over in life that I just kind of can't figure out what is going on here. And one of the experiences that led to this project was I spent the winter in New York City like three years ago. And it was a really bad winter. There was tons of blizzards. And I remember having a couple of experiences, one in particular of like extreme, like being really emotional just from sensory overwhelm. Mm -hmm. It's from being in Manhattan. I was like, I'm really overwhelmed. I feel really emotional and it's all sensory information. Like it was just like, I'm cold. I'm, it's loud. Like I, there's nowhere to, there's nowhere quiet, all this kind of just like assault on the senses. And I remember thinking like, wow, I had never really associated my sensory experience with my feelings in this way before. Like I feel really emotional. I feel like I'm going to burst into tears and I haven't had like a fight with anyone or anything like that. I'm just cold and it's loud and it smells and it's noisy and I just need to like go inside somewhere and I remember thinking like huh okay there's a there's a relationship that I either haven't considered or haven't considered maybe since I was young um between just my sensory experience and my feelings and then maybe even that same day or a few days later I was walking down to the public where I was working at the time and I passed a church. There was a sign outside that said this space is open to members of the public for moments of rest and reflection between the hours of whatever and whatever. Mm. And I was like, oh man, that's what I need. I need that. Like when I, you know, was uptown and I was lost and it was snowing and I was freezing and there was construction and horns and all this stuff. And I felt like I was going to cry. And I thought like, I would never in a million years think to myself, in that moment, you know what I need to find the nearest church. <laughs> um, and I thought like, why is that? You know, 
like, why not? And I thought, well, and I was thinking, oh, I didn't grow up with church. I don't, it's not in my really cultural, you know, upbringing. My, my family didn't go. I didn't, um, I sort of think of it. So there's, that's one piece. Like I didn't grow up with it. I don't, I think of it as an event rather than a place. Um, I don't really understand how it works. You know, you have to wear an outfit. I don't know the rules. I don't know how long it is. I might be embarrassed or overwhelmed or whatever. And I was walking into the public and I was like, this is all the reasons that people don't come in here too. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, these are all the struggles of like institutional art spaces. I didn't grow up with it. I don't understand it. I might, you know, Mm want to leave and that'll be weird or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, how can we make, I, I thought, oh, wow, this is like why I really like to make things that are in either public space or disused buildings or whatever, where that kind of threshold doesn't exist as much. Mm-hmm. And so I started thinking more about like how we could make performance, uh, use the world of like the vocabulary of performance making to make spaces rather than events. And then this, another thing that happened in that same time was that I went in a sensory deprivation tank had read some stuff about sensory deprivation and then experienced in sensory deprivation. So like in a float floating saltwater tank, dark tank, um, I guess there's different kinds of sensory deprivation, um, sort of had read and then experienced for myself that like under the conditions of sensory deprivation, things that feel like very permanent and fixed aspects of reality, are really malleable. Mm. Um, And I left the sensory deprivation tank thinking like, wow, I just really learned something about how suggestible my mind is. There was a moment in the tank where I was like, I kind of feel like I'm in space. I wonder how much it would take for me to believe that I was in outer space. And it took like nothing at all. Like I was like, hey, maybe you're in space. (laughs) All of a sudden, like I had a bodily sensation of like limitless, you know, zero gravity and limitless space. And I just thought, wow, like if I'm this suggestible under the conditions of sensory deprivation, how suggestible am I all the time? How much am I like just creating reality through what I can sense? Like if you take away one sense, I just will believe anything. Mm -hmm. Uh, What does that mean about life all the time? So then I thought, okay, I want to make these spaces that like deal with this theme that is that these themes that are troubling me, like what is reality? What's the relationship between senses and emotions? What, what, how suggestible are we? What does that mean about reality? How can we make space for each other that doesn't feel, you know, these different things that I'm talking about. And I sort of told all that to Chris Roundtree and we had made some work together and he said, do you think that could be a piece of music? Um, Because I was sort of saying I envision it for, for there, I said, you know, I don't, I see it in these spaces that don't really have any stuff in them that just have light and shadow that moves around and, and sound. And he was like, could that sound be music? Because if it can, then let's do it together. I would say the thing that always attracted it always attracted me about it, doing a piece that's about creating space and that this piece that's be, become called rest now, it's, it's become, it was like it has, it, we have, it eventually became called rest. Um, and you had like a list of musical terminology. I think that was, that was interesting. I actually never thought, when you said we should call the piece rest, I was like that, absolutely. But I never thought like, you know, it will be like a little Z with a little C attached to the bottom of it. What's interesting to me about that is like, so right now we have all this time to rest, actually. When we made this piece, at least my life, I'm sure all of our lives probably, we just felt very, very chaotic. And I didn't have any time to do any of the things I was doing. And there were so many projects and I wasn't, all of them didn't get a, enough, actually. And I just felt more and more and more overwhelmed by like how many things needed to happen in a day. And also I felt myself, and certainly this has been a journey for myself over the past five years, that I started to work slower and slower and slower and slower. And I just, without, I just, Every day I wake up overwhelmed. And so then fast forward now, it's when we're thinking about making the digital version of this piece and we started to make a conceive of a digital version and then we've now made the beginnings of a digital version of the piece. And it's in a time where all we have, many of us, particularly artists, is just empty space. 
it gets even somehow there's more. You're really grappling with yourself more and more and more. And then he found Emma O'Halloran, um, or Emma O'Halloran was recommended to us when we started to look for a composer. We hopped on a call, um, Chris, uh, Annie and I, and um, Annie told me some amazing stories about um, her her readings about sensory deprivation. I think, Annie, you had a story about... Um, um, feeling a sense of overwhelm in New York City and, and, and seeing a sign outside a, a church for um, a place for rest and, and reflection. And, and, um, and, I, and I thought the, ho- the whole idea of, of rest and, and sensory deprivation was really interesting. So I said, sure, I would love to be involved. And um, we, had, we had some conversations. Um, I flew to LA in November 2019 and we spend a few days um, floating in sensory deprivation tanks and and talking about um, just, uh, I guess, a lot of different things, early childhood sense memories and sense experiences. And um, and I I guess our our feelings of just being, I don't know, overstimulated by our phones and and social media and things like that. And we kind of eventually landed on something. Um, We decided to call the piece rest. (laughs) And that was the, the genesis, I think, of the project. And in and then I, we had three two days together, the three of us. And I focused those two days on finding a title because I usually just feel like that's a good way to try to, <laughs> or a way to try to shape things. And that was in that was a year ago. That was in November of 2019, um, and we were looking for a title that had a resonance with all the stuff I've just talked about and music, mm. Mm. musical meaning as well as a sort of um, yeah a meaning with, that touched all this stuff that I've been talking about. Mm-hmm. And so we chose rest. And then we and then we had a conversation that has been really instructive for the work, which was what they think of when they think of resting. And Chris talked about his phone, talked about deleting Twitter, talked about putting his phone away. And Emma talked about being in nature and being a kid, really. She talked about like some childhood memories of being in nature and kind of losing track of time. And those two topics have then become a lot of what I talked to people about when I started, yeah, interviewing people about what rest meant to them. I still ask those questions, those two questions about people's relationship with their smartphone and about their early life memories. So why don't we listen to some extracts of some of those interviews um, that really I asked people for early memories, early sense memories, so memories from childhood that were just to do with their body that maybe had some quality of transcendence or um, a hallucinatory quality or uh, a quality that sort of detached them from what we understand as concrete reality, really just to try to understand the connection between um, sensory experience and how we perceive or more accurately participate in what we consider to be real or not real. Um, So this starts with the writer David Abram describing one of those experiences and then goes into a a montage of of different folks talking about sensory experience, early life memories and their relationships with um, their phones or different communication or internet technologies. One night, I'm, I'm gazing up at the sky Uh, The Vietnam War is still whirling around us. I'm 11, uh, so it's late 60s. Um, And, and, you know, and and it was not a cloudy night. I'm there in Long Island. I'm gazing up, lying on the grass. I began to feel my skin starting to crawl and come alive like a community of bumblebees. And I'm hearing this buzzing in my ears. And then it felt, it was loud. It was like this. 
I felt my whole body turn inside out, <sighs> including my face, my head, turning inside out, and I'm looking into the depths of my own torso, and it's really black and dark, and um, and the whole thing is so weird. What's going on? And in the depths of that blackness, I begin to notice a point of light and another point of light, and then multiple points of light, some of them close to my eyes or my face where I'm gazing, and some of them much further away, and some in clusters, and some just uh, solitary, shining, or glimmering points. And I never realized that all of this was inside me, and all these lights. But I begin to feel this odd tickling sensation at my fingertips. I'm wondering, what is that? What's tickling me? And there's also this sensation of pressure against my head. And it's becoming more uh, thick as I'm staring into these lights, some near, some far. And then I began wondering, whoa, is that tickling? Is that the grass actually tickling my fingertips? Am I touching the grass blades? And then is that pressure? Whoa, is that actually the ground pressing up against the back of my head? Am I actually laying still on the ground? And then I realized that's just where I was. And all those points of light were actually the stars overhead. But now I'm seeing them for the first time in depth, some of them near, some of them way farther away. And as I realized that I'm still gazing up and my eyes had never closed, I was so shocked and I sat up. But everything around me was sparkling with energy. The air itself was just so charged. And, and I felt so good. And I'm looking up at the stars, but now I have this night sky in a way I never had it before in depth, some near, some far. And I look across at the fence on the far side of the, of the yard and then a little pond that other houses are arranged. And it's all so perfect. Everything was just as it had to be. It was an uncanny experience. Um, told my folks about the next day um, and they were really pissed that I was out after they thought I was asleep, but they could make no, couldn't make head or tail of the experience. Nobody I tried to relate it to uh, could, could, you know, reflect it back in any way, but that was so transformative for me and never left me that sense of the night, the, the, the safety of the night and the dark has never left me since. There's a lot of information to filter out and I feel like that filtering, there's also a level or like a layer of acknowledgement that you're, you, you know it's not real when you're experiencing it, but it feels really real. Like, I guess I, if I had asked myself, but I wasn't asking myself. Very odd as I grew up. Can you still hear me? It says the internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Okay. I, I found my security in, um, in darkness, in night, in unknowing, in that feel of... But I wasn't asking that question, you know? It's like, I'm not going to open my mind to this because I'm vain and in fear. <laughs> Can you still hear me? It says the internet connection is unstable. Can you still hear me? Okay. You know, take a step back and sit and just let yourself be, you know, there's the danger of um, that kind of just being more and more powerful. You know, when we look at the stars, they look at rest. They don't move much, but they do. And they, they move at an incredible speed, much more like, like we, 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 sometimes we think that's, that exists, but actually 
everything is happening. The matter is that in, in the human scale, we cannot perceive either the, you know, like right now so much is happening in, I don't know, in your hand, touching your neck. Everything is happening there. It's like a change of information and atoms communicating and energy transmission and electrons going wild and particles, whatever. Everything's happening there. You are okay, like as you are, like you are fine, this moment is fine. And perhaps de-accelerating certain rhythms, but rhythm is there and rhythm will always be there. Like since you, since you are a bunch of cells, one of the first things that starts forming is the heart and it will work. You know, it's incredible. Like this muscle, it's always boom, boom, boom. And you, and you will not stop that unless you... Oh my God, what am I going to do? And oh my God, what did you say? And oh my God, what did he mean? Did he really mean that? I don't think he meant it. Well, I... It's like, huh? Was that really one now? And I look at the watch and it's like, what the fuck? It was so fast. It's, it's, it's an illusion. And I was like, whoa, whoa, this is what happened to me. This is what happened to me. And, and it made complete sense. Places to get to and get out of. Just accepting, like... I'm struggling with this, that's how it is, and I'm just gonna keep trying over and over and over. There is nothing else. You know, like in physics, there's something. In physics, you don't experience velocity. You know, like when you're on a plane, you're not like, oh my God, this is going so fast, it's crazy. Now it just, it just feels like nothing, right? <laughs> uh, but what you feel, is changes in velocity. That is when something accelerates or decelerates. You know, like when you're on a, on a car and it starts accelerating, you're, you're pushed to the, to, the, to the seat. And if it stops abruptly, you're thrown like forward. And I think it, 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 putting this idea into, into, an, into another field, I think it's that, no? Like we can definitely experience how things get accelerated around us or deaccelerated. But speed itself, it's not something that we can feel. I don't know, I'm just putting ideas there. Most of the people that are sort of sitting there over their, you know, devices are still, but they're not at rest. Sometimes it's, it's more like, it's just, it's, it has to do more with where's your focus and in the number of things that you have your focus on, you know, uh, and, the, and the depth of that focus. If you are focusing uh, lightly in 10 things at the same time, then that's, you know, like the, the usual chaos we're in, you know, like trying to respond messages while trying to do work and trying to eat, etc. But when you you are I mean when you're able to focus on one thing like breathing, it's not that there's stillness there or a rest. It's simply there's depth in focus, and there is only one focus. There's your focal point. What we can experience, you know, just just from our bodies, is something that we can't really connect with when we're constantly on our phones or worrying about emails or worrying about what other people think about us or anything, right? So it, it's almost just like... I think it's incredibly damaging. It's sort of like directs traffic in some kind of way. Yes, come, yeah, you can come. No, you stop. Okay, you, you don't have to stop entirely, but just wait for a little bit. Now, no, you know, that kind of... It's, a, it's kind of a functionary. In the last year, I experienced that I'm slower reading books. Um, and it's like, why? Why is it for me? And I, you know, I, I, I have, I mean, I'm not flaunting, but I, I've done four degrees. I have, to, I have to read a lot in my life. And one of them was philosophy. So I was really a, a very good reader, a very deep reader. 
and on the last year, it's like, eh, why I'm struggling? Paragraph after paragraph is just like, because the way that my, my brain, you know, has been working is with very short bits of information and anything long, I start struggling. I'm like, whoa, there's like quick bits of information that are 99% Useless. Lock into the phone. Hi, hi, hi. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the, the the madness of emails and communications and handling ten things. That's when I feel like switch off Wi-Fi. Phone goes into sleeping mode. So sometimes I wonder what what if I could if I could do this like most of the day. Where where would I be? Or what kind of work will I be doing? And... It's nice to hear those impressions weaved together. I've heard you, Annie, talk a lot about these interviews and reference, you know, how they've influenced your conceptions of the work, even irrespective of the specific content of each exchange, maybe a general collective impression of different people's relationships to rest. Do you want to talk about what led you to interview people? You've told me a little bit about how you cast a wide research net at the beginning of any creation process. In this case, it seems like your interviews for this project are both a part of that, but also content gathering for the performance itself. If I look back at almost everything I've made, I've made it because I feel like I don't know the answer mm. to whatever it is, you know? Um, I have a ton of questions and I like the, the stuff that I want to make work about is stuff that I don't know anything mm -hmm. or I feel troubled, confused about. So it feels kind of natural to like ask people <laughs> questions. <laughs> I be, just became totally fascinated by asking people what rest meant to them and then asking like scientists what rest mm -hmm. meant. Um, and really anyone who I could find who I felt like was talking about these issues, you know, um, what is resting? What is it for? How does it function in the brain and the body? How does it relate to technology in particular, like handheld internet devices? Mm -hmm. um, and how does it relate? I mean, it's like I say, how does it relate to technology? But really, it's like, how does it relate to distraction, mm -hmm. information and overwhelm and stimulus? Mm -hmm. And so there was something about that that I wanted to, or that that felt like, oh, that was part of the early idea um, and and should continue to be part of the idea. But there was another thing that came up, which was about, which we've talked about before, which was about hallucinations, which are part mm -hmm. of part of sensory deprivation, right? People report hallucinatory experiences, which I actually really relate to this idea of like, we learn under sensory deprivation that our concept of reality is malleable. Right. Our experience of reality is malleable rather than like we hallucinate, if you see what I mean. And something like in the workshop with Chris and Emma in November, when I just pulled every book off the shelf that felt like it had anything to do with anything. One of the things was hallucinations by Oliver Sacks. And in the intro to that, he talks about um, a hallucination is dependent on an agreement or a disagreement with another person. If I have a sensory experience, then that experience is real for me. Well, if it's, you know, auditory or, or visual or whatever, but if you, if you don't share it, then, those are things that we would maybe start to classify as hallucinations. And we were talking about um, like reverb trails where, you know, the, the sound of an instrument in a room after the actual sound um, ha has stopped ringing and it's just the sound of the room. And um, that was something that I thought would be really interesting to have a sort of these ghost-like things where you, you sort of can... can they remind you of an instrument, but you might not be exactly sure of what it is. And I think it was that idea of like trying to make sense of what the visuals are. And then, you know, you're not really able to do that. And the same thing with the sound, like trying to make sense of what the sound is, but it's sort of maybe a little bit out of reach. And, and that idea of um, 
you know, eventually, hopefully, maybe you can let go of that and just like experience the sound. And, and maybe that is a sort of journey towards some form of, of restfulness or, or something like that. So I think it was the idea of like, maybe revealing and then hiding what the sound sources were. Um, I, I'm certainly interested, and I think Annie is too, in, in sounds that come out of your environment. And like, sometimes when you hear, you know, you hear like, <laughs> car cars passing by or or you know industrial sounds and it can be um an irritation or it can be sound and and it's kind of up to you to make that decision you can decide whether you hear music out of it or or you can just feel maybe it's 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 too much and you want to shut it out so i i love that sort of thing so i think at the time when i was sending on material to annie it was all um, there was these different collections of like I my first composition was like someone had this like really rusty music box I think it was supposed to play the Beatles um, Let It Be um, but yeah so it was just like it was my first kind of interaction with sound with electronics where I was like oh hey I can I can stretch the sound and I can put it upside down and if you put the same sound with different pitches on top of each other that makes a chord and it was like my journey into um writing music and um so I thought it was like a neat piece to share but I definitely like there's times where I will listen to like screeching subway cars and think that is so beautiful (laughs) um so uh, you know like it's one of those things where I'm like there is a place for it in this piece somewhere you know I think it's I guess these decisions you you use your mind to decide whether you you know, I think you can make yourself feel rested somehow. It, it is an active process, so. okay okay like I want to hear something I want to hear something like that and then and then when I would sort of close my eyes and think about what that might be I would see things and you know like we don't it's not dark when we close our eyes actually (laughs) like we see light right behind our eyelids and light ambient light from the room and sort of after images of things that we've been looking at or squinting light phenomena Mm -hmm. or whatever and so I was like, okay, I see that if, if this has visuals, it's something like this. It's like light. It's just light and shadow that you don't quite know what it is. It, it's been so interesting to, um, 
experiment to, yeah, like you say, like to truly experiment with what's possible in the medium in this way where like, okay, I come to making live performance by thinking about where the audience are, how they feel, what their body is doing, what the door to the space is like, how they come in, where they go when they come in, what the room feels like, et cetera. Like, how can I bring all of that to making stuff for a space, a physical space where I don't, I don't have that control. I don't know where the audience is. Um, but I can, I don't know, like I'm, I'm hoping to make something where the person experiencing it feels like, Oh, this, this person on the other end of this creative object really thought about me and what I'm doing Mm -hmm. um, and what this would be like for me. And I do feel, I feel bolstered in having made this, this experiment that we made about bringing, bringing an expression of this work to the internet. I, I feel affirmed in my belief that we can make unique things for devices and that there is a need for our way of seeing the world.